Pacific, spreading in majestic silence from the Pole Star to the Southern Cross. Looking out with increasing anxiety over this vast ocean are the people of the New World's western shores, for well they know that on the great waters outside their gates, the tide of war is flowing closer. On their city streets today are American citizens from the Far East, telling of mounting tension in the Orient. And over the line in Canada are women and children hurriedly evacuated from British Pacific outposts, glad to see once more the familiar symbols of a friendly world. And all along the West Coast waterfronts, the traffic of war grows daily more intense. In through the narrows of Vancouver's harbor come the ships from Sydney and Wellington with their loads of airmen destined for Canadian training bases. From the oil ports of California go the tankers, laden to the plimsoll mark, westward through the Golden Gate with their cargoes of fuel for Soviet Russia. And in shipyards up and down the long Pacific coast, from Prince Rupert to San Diego, the beat of hammers sounds out night and day as keel after keel is laid and new warships for Western Hemisphere defense glide down the ways. Registered with U.S. and Canadian authorities, along with other foreign nationals, are the Japanese residents of the West Coast. Intensely loyal to the democratic principles they have adopted, these American and British Japanese subjects are proud of the New World heritage with its promise of a peaceful future as farmers and fishermen. But for them, the tension across the ocean has a special and poignant significance. For today, as they go about their business up and down the coast, they see the watchers stationed at key points all along the shore, with their glasses fixed on the western horizon. For out there, beyond the war clouds lowering over the Pacific, lies militant Japan. Japan, where beneath the shadow of the sacred volcano Fujiyama live the 70 million people who pose one of the greatest risk question marks of modern times. Three quarters of a century ago, a land veiled in mystery, Japan today stands sixth among the trading nations of the globe. From the industrial democracies, the United Kingdom and the United States, she learned the secrets of modern manufacture. On their experience, she built her merchant navy, believed by many travelers to be one of the finest on the seven seas. Into the capitals of the free nations, in the years succeeding World War I, Japan sent her ambassadors of goodwill. Among them, well-loved Prince Chichibu, brother of the emperor. For to the great democracies, she looked for support as a growing world power. But today, the face of Japan changes, playing upon the pride of a nation which has from the earliest times admired the fighting traditions of the warrior samurai. It's a relatively small group of army leaders, their appetites for conquest already whetted in Manchukuo and China. The Nazi doctrine of the master race, the Japanese generals see a swift road to the creation of the greater Asia, which they believe to be their country's destiny. And in this program of education for total war, their teachers are the super strategists of belligerent Germany. In every Japanese munition plant, in her aircraft factories, her shipyards, and her steelworks, can be seen German blueprints and specifications, German methods of manufacture, for in the research departments of every factory are Nazi engineers, chemists, and experts supervising, leading, teaching. Seldom in recent months have Japan's ambassadors of goodwill been seen among free nations. Instead, 
Prince Tichibu pays the courtesies of his country to the diplomatic representatives of the Third Reich. And here in the German Embassy at Tokyo is the headquarters of a veritable occupation of Japan, a nationwide system of political intrigue woven by some 3,000 Nazi agents. Here are shown to the Japanese high command and to government officials suspected of democratic sympathy, motion pictures descriptive of the might of the Wehrmacht. Here too, the Orient is introduced to German culture. So the old Japan disappears, and a new generation arises, schooled in devotion to totalitarian Nippon, a generation trained in the virtues of the samurai warrior heroes, frugality, sacrifice, discipline. important, now that Japan has accepted the German principle of national leadership, is the figure of the emperor, Hirohito, son of heaven. Obeyed without question as supreme temporal ruler of his people, the emperor is also revered by the entire nation as the divine descendant of the sun goddess. Though theoretically combining in himself all power, the emperor must in practice delegate his authority to those most influential in national affairs. Wielding this authority until recently has been moderate, scholarly Prince Fumimaro Konori, second only to the imperial house in the nobility of his lineage. Day after day, in the seclusion of his Tokyo villa, Prince Konori strove to strike a balance between his own policy of gradual expansion and that of the fire-eating generals, conquest at all costs. But on October 17, 1941, the people of Tokyo beheld the replacement of Prince Konoi by an active soldier, General Aiki Tojo, known for his incisive, determined actions as the Razor. For long months, General Tojo has insisted that Japan's total economy must be harnessed to the demands of the army. Great was the rejoicing in the German embassy that night, for Ambassador Eugene Ott and his 3,000 agents had not overlooked the fact that the new prime minister was once Japanese military attaché in Berlin, nor had they forgotten that he was formerly head of the powerful Kenpei Tai, Japan's Gestapo. At the sacred shrine of Ise, the new premier makes known his assumption of office to the sun goddess. And as he kneels, Japan remembers the words of his avowed policy. Nippon must become a high degree defense state. The whole nation must move as one fiery cannonball of resolution. So for Japan, the die is cast. The army wins its long struggle for power and Nippon takes a new oath. Greater Asia is approaching. The historic march of the Japanese people has begun under the great ideal of the birth of the nation. defense of all Pacific powers against belligerent Japan is China, whose fierce resistance through four long years has cost Nippon more than a million killed and wounded. But today, Japan musters new strength for expansion in Eastern Asia, up country from the coast of French Indochina, under the eyes of impotent Vichy officials, go Japanese forces heading for Yunnan and the Thai frontier massing against the vital Burma Road, China's lifeline. And far to the north, the Kwantung Army, Nippon's crack 
force and original conquerors of Montuquo in 1931 moves into battle positions along the Amu River borders of Siberia. Even more closely watched by the maritime Pacific powers is Japan's seagoing army, highly trained in the shock tactics of surprise landings. By far the most formidable to be reckoned with is the Imperial Navy. From fishing communities up and down the coast, the Navy's rank and file are born seamen. For the Japanese, like the British, from the earliest times been an island people. Limit cruising range to some 1,500 miles and mounting less than 100 heavy caliber guns, the tactic of the Japanese battle fleet must be to strike swiftly and hard before the combined strength of the United States and Britain can be massed against it. Manned and ready, from Alaska to the Canal Zone, are the coast defenses of North America, and every strange ship is liable to be stopped in her tracks with a warning shot across her bows. Behind the guns, the coastal area is alive with troops specially trained in repulsing landing parties and raiding expeditions. For the U.S. and Canada well know that the oceans are no longer barriers, but highways of conquest, and in close collaboration, they have laid their strategic plans. Responsible for the coastline between Alaska and the border is Canada. Here, dropping sheer into the ocean amid miles of twisting inlets, the coastal ranges of the Canadian Rockies offer perfect concealment for submarines and raiders. Day and night, a fleet of fishing boats, now on active service with the Navy, patrols the fjords, ready to summon immediate help if suspicion is aroused. In constant contact with them, is the outer patrol, fast new corvettes, heavily armed with depth charges and capable of dealing with the largest long-range submarines. Under intensive training at bases ashore are the crews who will man the Royal Canadian Navy's expanding Pacific squadrons. Men from the farms and forests of British Columbia, many of whom have spent their lives along the rugged, twisting coastline and know its every trick of wind and weather. But today, the defenses of the Western Hemisphere powers stretch far beyond their home shores. Out in mid-ocean, running down from the far north to the Hawaiian Islands, is the first of two great defensive rings, a blue water bastion held by the U.S. Navy. The pivot point of this mid-ocean barrier is the great base of Pearl Harbor, Gibraltar of the Pacific situated on the island of Oahu in the Hawaiian group. Believed to be the world's most powerful fortress, Pearl Harbor is garrisoned by 25,000 troops, manning batteries of monster 16-inch guns with ranges up to 20 miles. At 14 airfields in the surrounding islands, a long-range attack and bomber squadron, now at full battle strength. But the first task of Pearl Harbor is to act as operating base for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Supplied from here, the 12 capital ships of this great armada, with their attendant screens of cruisers and destroyers, can fight a fleet action anywhere from the Arctic Circle to Panama, and can even strike with full force into the Western Pacific. In 1943, with the two ocean navy in full commission, the Pacific Fleet will hold overwhelming superiority in tonnage, firepower, and speed. And even today, it can outsteam and outgun the most formidable force that its potential enemies can bring against it. Rapid salvo! Pacific, on the shores of Asia itself, stands the outer ring of defense, a chain of vital outposts manned by three Pacific powers, Russia in the north,
Britain in the China Sea, the United States at the gateway to the rich islands of the Southern Ocean. Where the hills of eastern Siberia slope down to the icy sea stands Vladivostok, guardian base of Soviet Russia's territory in Asia, less than 500 miles from the Japanese coast. Operating out of this harbor are 175 Soviet submarines, the largest single submarine fleet in the world, keeping close watch on the movement of Japanese ships up and down the coast. And inland, at battle stations along the critical frontiers of Mongolia and Manchukuo are two special red banner armies maintained almost at full strength despite the need for men and equipment on Russia's European front. All important in the defense of the Southern Pacific is the British peninsula of Hong Kong in the South China Sea. With its women and children evacuated, with its garrison reinforced by large contingents from Canada, Hong Kong has the vital duty of acting as advance observation post for Singapore, of sending out the submarine flotillas based in its harbor to harass a southward moving enemy until the big guns can join battle. Across the China Sea, guarding the gateway to the Dutch East Indies and Malaya are the Philippine Islands, long coveted by certain Japanese as part of Nippon's Asiatic co-prosperity sphere. And today, setting aside all thought of independence from U.S. influence, President Manuel Quezon collaborates with General Douglas MacArthur in transforming the richest sugar-growing land in the world into a formidable fortress. But most significant in Pacific strategy is the redoubled interest of the U.S. in its Arctic possessions. Twice a week at Seattle's wharves, defense experts board the northbound clippers. Their destination, Juneau, Alaska. Their task, to meet a new threat to the Western Hemisphere. On the schoolroom maps, the shortest route for bombing aircraft heading for the American coast from the shores of Asia appears to be a straight line across the ocean, 7,000 miles in length. But to the long-range bomber pilot, the picture is very different. His map is the globe. And across the curved surface of the Earth, the most direct route is far shorter and far easier. This is the Great Circle Route, 4,800 miles across the land arch of the Northern Pacific, a route studded with islands and natural harbors, providing good landing points for flying boats. On this great circle approach to the Western Hemisphere, the attention of strategists is closely centered. For now, they regard the far northern Aleutian Islands and Alaska as the first and most vital line of aerial defense for the cities of the Pacific coast. <laughs> Up the rock-bound Canadian coast, through the rain clouds drifting over the Queen Charlotte Islands, through the inner passage where the wash of the sea laps the feet of giant glaciers, go U.S. destroyers with materials and men for new bases building in the north. And here, at Dutch Harbor, Atu, Kodiak, names that mean little today but may mean everything tomorrow, 20,000 men rush the construction of docks and ramps and repair shops for the big patrol bombers. And up through the snows of British Columbia, across the frozen rivers of the north, the Peace, the Prophet, and the Liard, go the dog teams, breaking trail for the heavy tractor trains as Canada builds a chain of airports from the border to the Yukon. Airports which will act as stepping stones and fueling stations for U.S. and Canadian fighter squadrons heading northward to Alaska. Already over this new route, the pursuit ships and the bombers are flying up, northward bound for duty on the roof of the world. And so today, as they hear the roar of the patrol planes sweeping out on their ceaseless watch over mountain and sea, 
the people of the Pacific Coast know that their defenses stretch out across one third of the Earth's circumference and range unbroken from the icebergs of the north to the coral islands of the southern sea. And in these proud cities of the western shores, where war once, once seemed remote, they are mobilized and prepared. And as the war clouds gather across the broad Pacific, and the lights go out in the last great area of the world to know peace, they know that beyond the western horizon, far out on the great waters, the guns stand ready, ready through the night.